Today's topic is the Inuit way of life. Inuit is Inuktitut for the people. This video is provided to you by Natalie, Zainab, and Andrea. In this video, we will discuss the Inuit's way of life before contact with the Europeans. We will then focus on the Inuit governance structure. Then there will be a quick timeline going over the history of the Inuit people since coming in contact with the Europeans. Then we will talk about the issues facing the Inuit people in a contemporary society. When things came to be is the origin story for the Inuit people. The story begins with stone and soil falling from the sky. Soon animals and babies emerged from the land, since life came from the land. Animals and humans were equal beings and were family. Things in the strong days were willed into existence, since will gave sense to other things. The first people had the strongest will, and with that will, they changed the land. They created light and darkness and the sun and the moon. As they walked the earth, they found children and raised them. They continued to will things into existence. There was no limits, just their imagination. Some people began to grow tired and lay down to become hills, but they didn't know death. Those who had not become hills grew attached to their things and created dogs to help, help carry their things. With the dogs, humans spread out and covered the entire land. People started to forget that they were once family with the animals. Humans started to see themselves as better than animals. People then dreamed of different nations and forgot how to speak to one another. They then used the last of their strength to separate themselves into man and woman. The humans became hungry and started to hunt the animals, and the animals didn't like this. However, they knew life had to feed on life, and agreed if they were treated with respect, they would allow themselves to be hunted. If not, the animals would withdraw into hiding. Then some people lay down and stopped breathing. However, some of them did not know how to stay dead and would get back up. Those who had died, their will went up into the sky, where it became the northern lights, since no life can truly die. Now the strong days have passed. Animals and humans have no strength at all. The Inuit land covered a large portion of the north. This land included the Yukon, the Northwest Territories, Nunavut, Quebec, and Labrador. Greenland is also a part of their nation, but since it's now part of Denmark, some people don't include that land as part of the Inuit nation. The Inuit have several different languages, and they all vary depending on which region they are in. There are five in total, Inuktitut, Inutut, Inupiaq, Inu, Yaluktun, and Kalaliset. Inuktitut is spoken in Nunavut and northern Quebec. Inutitu is spoken in northern Labrador. Inupiaq is spoken in northern Alaska. Inuvialuktun is spoken in the north of the Northwest Territories. And Kalisut is spoken in Greenland. For all these languages, the dialects vary from community to community, since communities can be quite isolated, so they develop their own specific way of speaking. Before the Europeans arrived, the Inuit had an oral culture, meaning they didn't write anything down. Laws, stories, and other traditions were remembered and told to children so that they could remember and pass the stories along. Animals were very important to the Inuit people. The two most important animals were the seals and the dogs. Dogs were important to the Inuit people. While traveling during the summer was easy, as soon as winter came around, the snow made it hard to move around. Dogs were useful to help pull the sleds so they could travel a greater distance. Dogs were also useful for hunting. They could help find seals and scare off the larger animals like bears. Seal hunting is a part of the Inuit way of knowing as their way of knowing includes knowledge about wildlife and nature. It's also an essential part of their economy as it provides food, clothing, and oil. Henry Morgan, an English sailor, was impressed by the fact that the Inuit were using copper tools. 
Years later, Klangenberg spent extensive amounts of time studying the Inuit people. He noticed that they used copper knives and would sew using copper needles. They would even make tips of arrows out of copper. That is because the north of Canada was rich in natural copper, which the Inuit had access to. After the Europeans made contact with the Inuit, a lot has happened. These are just some of the events that would affect the Inuit people, or affect all nations going forward. In 1586, the first encounter with the Inuit was written by the English sailor John Davis. Davis himself seemed to be quite fond of the Inuit people, but his writing was more idyllic. However, this writing encounter gives us a clear idea of how the Europeans interacted with the Inuit. Mostly trade, but the Europeans did incite violence. In 1604, the French start to settle in Canada. In 1605, the English start to settle in Canada. In 1659, French missionaries start to explore the north. Between 1750 and 1820, the Hudson Bay Company started setting up trading posts in Inuit land. These posts were either for selling furs or for processing whale products. In 1750, English missionaries land in Labrador. The missionaries use more direct tactic to assimilate the indigenous population. In 1759, English gained controls over the French settlement. The English now control most of North America. In the 1850s to the 1950s, Christian missionaries moved throughout the Arctic. This gave way to a second wave of contact with the Europeans. In 1867, Canada becomes a confederation. Britain has less control over Canada. Now the indigenous peoples of Canada have to deal with the Canadian government instead of the British. Nunavut is the last territory to join the Dominion of Canada. In 1880, the British Crown gives some of the Arctic lands to Canada. In 1880, Indian Affairs Department was established. However, the Indian Act only dealt with the First Nations and excluded the Inuit people. In 1896, Edmund Peck introduced syllabics as a written form of Inuktitut. This was in an effort to make the Inuit language easier for the Europeans. Peck used a similar method as the method to translate Cree. In 1898, Yukon was considered a separate Tory. This means that they were in charge of that land. Gold was discovered beginning the gold rush. Now, let's talk about the evolution of governance. Prior to being contacted, the Inuit people lived a very peaceful life and were able to maintain stability through their own form of self-governance. Laws were not written down, but instead established through oral traditions which were passed on through generations. They were created through public decisions and applied differently depending on the season due to spiritual connection to the land. Inuit communities had both leaders and elders. The leaders are those who possess extensive knowledge of the territory and its resources. The elders are any person regardless of gender who possesses recognizable knowledge that they can share. Neither of which were viewed as officers of the region. In fact, there is no law enforcement agency that oversees these rules because it was seen as a responsibility for the community as a whole to hold each other accountable. The efficient system functioned because each individual knew their behavior expectancies, community values, and had spiritual beliefs which guided them. Spirituality was a huge factor because of the belief of natural order. All wrongful actions will have a punishable reaction on those in the community. For example, a sin will cause bad weather. Any actions that were unimproved of were dealt with in a way that will not punish the offender but rather restore the peace. Punishment was not included in their way of disciplining because they rely on interdependence and recognize that all individuals contribute to the welfare of the community. If an individual is removed, then the community will suffer from their lack of presence. This is why how they discipline is carefully thought out and largely depends on the action they performed. If the offender performed a small action, then the individual will simply be spoken to privately by an elder in a respectful manner. If the action reoccurs or a more extreme action was performed, then the individual will face a consequence that was decided by the community. For example, the offender may be asked to leave the community and live on their own so that they could learn to appreciate their community. In the event that the community does not know how to react to the offender, then they will consult elders for knowledge on how similar cases in the past were handled. Their method of self-governance ensured peace, security, and stability for many generations. 
Their form of self-governance remained as a main force of peace until settlers arrived. Initial contact with settlers did not affect their system of governance until they were properly recognized by the colonizers. Once that recognition was made, the Canadian law enforcement agencies took over their traditional way of governing. They sent police to regulate and deal with offenders in a colonist court system so that they could be the main mediators. The Inuit people were excluded from any legal affairs that concerned them and were no longer able to consult offenders as a community. It forced the Inuit people to become accustomed to colonial justice systems such as punishment and jail time. It wasn't until recently that the Inuit were allowed to provide input on how offenders are dealt with. Elders are now able to act as intermediaries between young offenders and the courts. In the Inuvialut region, the Young Offenders Act has been created to allow elders to interfere with the legal proceedings, allowing offenders to stay within their communities and be counseled rather than standing before a judge. Slowly, the Inuit people have been gaining autonomy on the proceedings of their region. Nunavik was the first region to attain self-governance in Canada. Other regions are gaining influence in the legal system by applying their legal traditions into the colonial justice system. Inuit Kawi Maya Tuhani, otherwise known as IQ, is an example of traditional Inuit law that is used to guide the Canadian government. IQ is prominently found in the justice system because of the political structures it outlines. The Nunavut Social Development Council describes IQ as a concept that encompasses all aspects of Inuit culture, including values, worldview, language, social organizations, knowledge, life skills, perceptions, and expectations. A very monumental moment for the Inuit of Nunavut occurred in the 1993 land claims agreement with the government. As a result, the Nunavut territorial government was created, otherwise seen as an institution where Inuit legal traditions could be implemented. The government is now seen using IQ to aid them in structuring its legislations and administrations. Processes of dealing with conflict of interest can now be seen influenced by IQ. There are around 20 Inuit concepts that are applied because of IQ. Some are working together for a common cause, openness, acceptance, and exclusivity, fair treatment, and keeping order in place. The Nunavut government has taken into account these Inuit legal traditions. This is recognized as a great first approach. However, there are still many legal traditions that could be applied. Inuit elder O Pilar Juk stated that Tidigusit, which refers to things that should be avoided, has the potential to be applied. It is a legal tradition that many non-Inuit already have, for example, not working on Sundays. O Pilar Juk recognizes that not all Tidigususi could be applied in a contemporary setting, however, they can be compared to present Canadian tradition. For example, Tiri Gusu Seed entails that campsites be kept clean out of respect for the land and animals. This Tiri Gusu Seed is regarded as a wise traditional law that has the potential to be effective in environmental and land use planning. Colonization has impacted the Inuit way of self-governing and although some progress has been made in implementing traditional laws, there is still room for more to be done. Today, there are four Inuit regions in Canada, the Inuvialuit Settlement Region, which is the Northwest Territories, Nunavut, Nunavik, which is Northern Quebec, and Nunatsiavut, which is Northern Labrador. Moving forward, we will now be talking about the transition into contemporary society and how this affected the Inuit nation. Sheila is one of the most recognized Inuit environmental and human rights activists. She is a Nobel Peace Prize nominee and a political representative for the Inuit. Her book, The Right to be Cold, helped me to understand the Inuit transition into contemporary society and the journey to protect the Inuit culture, the Arctic, and the whole planet. Sheila states, while many of the changes are positive, the journey into the modern world was not an easy one, and it has left its scars. Although the Inuit had considerable contact with the Europeans before 1945, they retained much of their traditional way of living throughout the first half of the 20th century. On the Eurocentric side, one might think that the Second World War brought about technical innovation in communications, transportation, and resource development, including atomic energy and weapons. 
This is true, but between 1939 and 1945, the government was preoccupied with the Second World War and most attention focused on the North was for sovereignty-related concerns rather than Inuit welfare. Nunavut became an alternative route for getting resources from North America to Britain. Air bases established disrupted the Inuit hunting and took up the Inuit hunting land. This is a factor that is often overlooked when being educated about the Second World War and the Inuit nation. By the 1950s, the federal authorities, conscious of growing inequality in material terms between Southern and Northern Canada, developed programs for Inuit health, housing, schooling, all of which tended to pull people into a handful of government commercial centers year-round. Inuit have always understood that while government programs introduced in that era were meant to confer material benefits, they also function as instruments of social control, undermined traditional ties to the land, and disrupted the intergenerational transfer of knowledge. During 1953 to 1955, the high Arctic relocation occurred. Inuit families were forcibly removed from their homes to permanent settlements. As a result, the Inuit struggled to preserve hunting and trapping practices, language, collective social and economic organization. The relocation of the Inuit was followed by the elimination of sled dogs by government authorities. It has been alleged that about 20,000 sled dogs were killed from the 1950s through to the 1970s. Many Inuit lost their dogs in these ways before snowmobiles provided a viable replacement, and many could not afford those machines when they did become available. The economic loss made many traditional skills redundant. The Inuit sled dog is essential to the seasonal rounds of Inuit life. They are large and dangerous animals, but the Inuit has successfully managed them for countless generations. In the early 1960s, the government of the day believed that Southern education was an important step in training young Inuit to be the future leaders of their communities. The federal government convinced that the Inuit families they were selecting promising children with a potential for leadership to be educated outside of the Arctic. Inuit children headed south, leaving their families, culture, and community life. The Southern education came at the cost of the Inuit knowledge and skills, including the mother language. The 1983 European ban on seal pup skins was life-altering for the Inuit. There was an Inuit exemption, but this did nothing to protect the Inuit. Anti-sealers pushed the European Union to pass a new ban worse than the old one, banning all seal species. The seal skin market fell from 30,000 skins a year to less than 1,000 seal skin sales. In contemporary society, people and animal rights campaigners, such as PETA, despise seal hunting and call seal hunters horrible things. The stereotype must be overcome as we learn about seal hunting from an Inuit traditional perspective. Unfortunately, I would have to say that before doing this research, I was always sympathetic about the cute little seals PETA says are inhumanely killed. It is not uncommon for animal welfare groups to portray hunting as an evil and greedy thing. However, Inuit know their land and animals, but the Eurocentric ban on all seal species states otherwise. Now let's talk about how awesome seal hunting is for the Inuit. The seal harvest provides important economic value to individuals and communities, as well as sources of income much needed to help sustain livelihoods and ways of life. In the Inuit culture, hunting teaches the value of patience, endurance, courage, and good judgment. To be a successful hunter, you can't be noisy. During long hours out on the ice and snow, hunters must remain quiet so that the animals are not driven away by the sound of human voices. Even physically, the Inuit have learned the importance of quiet. The ability to remain still is an essential survival skill on a hunt. These habits have become a part of the Inuit social behavior too. Awesome, right? I hope by now that you've had the opportunity to learn a lot about the Inuit nation that you did not know beforehand. We would like to now share with you how this project has allowed us to gain a better understanding of the Inuit history, culture, and protocols. Hi, I'm Andrea. I found this project very interesting because I got the chance to kind of break some of the myths I held about the Inuit people. I find that a lot of our education doesn't really focus on the Inuit people, it's more on the First Nations and the Métis. So I was really glad that I got the chance to kind of learn a bit more about their culture and about the peoples that um, live up in the north. Everyone, my name is Zainab. 
So throughout this research project, I learned a lot about how the Inuit people self-govern themselves prior to being contacted and also saw how it What stood out to me the most is how they disciplined their wrongdoers. Instead of straight away yelling at them or punishing them, they instead approached them in a respectful manner that makes them feel loved. My name is Natalie. Um, I'm taking a minor in Aboriginal Studies and I found that I've learned a lot about the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit culture. Um, before taking this course, I actually haven't had the chance to um, expand on my knowledge of, of the Inuit culture. And by being able to do this research project, um, I've been able to um, kind of understand the historic injustices between the government and the Inuit nation. And now that you have viewed our video on the Inuit nation, I challenge you to share this knowledge with one other person. The Inuit people play an important part in our future, and this is a step forward to challenge the current stereotypes and revitalize Inuit history and culture. Thank you for listening.